heated build chamber situation was that a lot of companies weren't making them in the last couple of years due to patent issues. Like, what, Stratasys or some company like that was holding patents on the heated build chambers. Okay. No. Um, mm. Not right? No, that is or, correct. But I'm, I'm just okay. saying, no problem. <laughs> yeah. The design that we have is, I don't even think is patentable. I, I saw the patent. The patent is, is on the bellows thing I mentioned. Interesting. So we're doing it simpler, and we're patent free. That's the beauty here. Nice. Now that's a little bit of, to me, this is absolutely obvious. And I, once again, I, I'm saying I don't know why nobody does it. I think the reason why nobody does it is that nobody can s scale their printer systems that effectively. We can. Mm -hmm. And that's why for me, I'm saying piece of cake, scalable yeah. modular. So I think we've got something right there. It's super simple. It's like. I mean, it's no brainer. Um, but somebody who doesn't subscribe to the universal axis or who doesn't design in a modular way, which is everybody, uh, it's a problem. So mm -hmm. this is where, where I think our methods shine. Our methods shine at a very large scale because we're scalable. That's like, for example, with a tractor, we can make a $250,000 tractor for probably like 25,000 in parts. Whereas for a small tractor, it will cost us like like maybe 5k for a tractor that's equivalent maybe like 20k maybe there's like a four or five factor whereas at the larger scale it's 10 and better you know so the larger we go the more advantage we get and that's probably why that hasn't happened but if we assume that that's a tractable problem if that's a solvable problem mm -hmm. what else is in the way of of succeeding here that's that's the kind of clarity when we go to this contest i think that part of the messaging is this we have identified very clearly the problem that we're solving and we're solving for that problem and here's what the solution gives you i think that's the kind of logic we have to use and if we make that thinking credible we can make get a lot of support for that and the question on our side the onus is are we very sure about that and if, i mean i would just ask anybody here it's like okay is the possibility of 3d printing large objects what is in the way we know some of the things in the way it's the cost of filament you can't do that because of the cost of filament so we know that's why it doesn't happen and the second part is well what about large existing printers what do they do well they're very very expensive the the high temperature ones so we're solving that issue by low cost infrastructure for doing that um so and they're almost all proprietary it's all proprietary that's true so we're saying we're going to open it and distribute it to the world um i think everything lines up lines up here because there's not a question whether you can print larger and larger objects yeah you can uh, plastic lumber exists. They already make mm -hmm. plastic things. This is the advantage that you get the plastic lamp lumber plus the composite structures that they make from that. Yeah. So why doesn't somebody just injection mold these panels cheap? Well, because uh, fresh plastic resin is not cheap. Mm -hmm. It's actually at the dollar a pound kind of level. Here we're talking about trash that's free or 10 cents a pound from a, a recycler, or something to that effect. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, trying we want to try to poke holes. Like, what's wrong with this? Why why would this not work? Um, but if you're doing, you know, things like structural panels in, or structural insulated panels, that's a known thing in the building industry. Plastic lumber is known. I think there's some innovation to be done in terms of multi-layer structures that you 3D print that have airspace, they're actual insulators. Mm -hmm. There's innovation on, okay, let's make the plumbing integrated with the panels and other things. So um, I look hard for, for errors in this model. Let's open this up. What do you guys think is the, like, does this work? Is it going to work? Like what? What's wrong with well, what's wrong with the plan? Like, can you really? We have abundant plastic. That's the other thing. Like, 
I just looked into this again and I thought, oh, there's only so much trash. But no, there's huge volumes of trash. Enough for the house supply of 10 United States. Yeah. So and all the plastic floating around the ocean. Specifics of it? Like, of why it wouldn't? Or why something? We're trying to identify, like, what what's... So what about the composition the of the different, like it's trash plastic, but what yeah. about the compositions of the plastic? Like in there we have all that plastic, but it's one plastic's one grade, another one's another yeah. grade with different tolerances. And yeah, I think that that can be addressed <laughs> by several, several ways. One is you can separate things and you can have panels um, based on materials. The second way is if you have a small amount of one versus the other, just alloying them or just mixing them doesn't matter. The third way is that some plastics are completely compatible versus others, they don't mix, they don't bond to each other. Right. So that's an issue. Um, maybe you can't do it for that specific formula, so the issue is, okay, let's develop formulas that are robust and work, or you get... You get plastic bales that are just a composition of one one kind of item. So that's a definite issue. Like a lot of people talk that, oh, you can't print with plastic because uh, it's got too much dirt in it and you clog the nozzles. Not an issue because we're using very large nozzles where we don't care about this. When you're printing big things, you, you're mu much more forgiving. Uh, there's definitely code issues like, okay, now we want to have this approved by certifying bodies. Yeah, cool. No problem. We'll go through that. We know that plastic's got a certain strength, it's stronger than wood, so we'll be fine at partial infill. So, um, I don't know, there's, I, I can point to one, which is that you can only recycle plastic so many times, it's like five times before they degrade but okay you're you're trapping that waste plastic and you're doing it the first time and you're done because your house lit wants to live forever right so that's not really an issue like some people say oh you, can, you can't recycle plastic because you can only do it it degrades like 20 percent every time you do it before you can't really print with it so you have to put in 20 percent new stuff every time you do it. but there's plenty of virgin trash <laughs> Can we go toward like a recycling facility? Yeah. I noted that as well, like sourcing. Like sourcing should be relatively easy. Just like yeah. you can walk out there and like Not a the problem. street get a sand and oh, source some. You collect <laughs> people's <laughs> trash. You can yeah, start. I know, I'm just saying like it. You can start talking about like start a recycling company uh, right now, you know. Uh, right. Take people's trash. Hey, people start separating your trash. There's only a recycling center in town. So you can go there, uh, just a basic recycling facility. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of distributing the enterprise, like if you have the equipment to do this on a community scale, then you can start collecting that trash on a community scale, because right now all that trash has to travel far, and it's part of the reason why plastic doesn't get recycled. It's too, too hard. It's, a, once again, a centralized thing. So here we're saying we're addressing that by decentralization of the technology, the know-how. Um, Actually, it's a really good idea because then you, you, I mean, you have that su that supply chain, like you kind of have the whole. Yeah, but it's hard to sort it um, if it's decentralized. Like yeah. from, from what I understand, like you know, there's a lot of contamination. Someone, it like it will never be yeah, clean. Say, yeah. Say. Yeah. So say you've got yeah that like cleanliness. Like say you're doing plain people's trash. It's going to be all nasty. But okay, so maybe we, we have to do a washing cleaning station people, at the first. You could yeah. pay people to give us, uh, like, you could reward people for giving clean plastics or detect when people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, or, like, and say, like, give discounts to people. We can buy people's plastic too. Like, uh, you know, we can, because we'd buy a bale at 10 cents a pound. I mean, I'm sure some people would do it for 10 cents a pound, even. If they're doing a good thing, you know, they just save all their, you have your recycling bins every so often you get, you know, you take that to a place and you get a few bucks for it. Um, I mean, it's a good thing to do because it takes it out of the trash, trash stream. Um, so, and then we want to study industry standards. So what are the best projects that have tried to do this? And we know, we know some things like precious plastic or there's this other so what's the, let's talk about precious plastic. What's the limit there? They don't have 3D printers, so they can't 
be as flexible as we can be in terms of geometries. Um, they work, they do have a little bit of injection molding and things like that, but it's, it's not really necessarily industrial scale, so it's, it's kind of more like hobby and art. Um, that, that's a good project, but it doesn't get us to where we need there. They did start making these blocks that they compressed, I guess, compressed or um, injection molded. But once again, um, to do that effectively requires huge machinery if, if you're going to do it in an economically competitive way. The 3D printer allows you to do economically competitive product with very minimum infrastructure. We always get this question, uh, why don't you just injection mold this stuff? Well, that's heavy equipment. That's some forms that need to be custom made for each thing that you that you make. With 3D printing, you have none of that restriction. So, if you're making a thousand different things, you're going to spend a million dollars in in molds, or possibly a few thousand per per mold. Here, you don't have molds to inject mold into. It's free form. So, uh, there's that advantage. There's another. There's some other. Um, so that's the study of industry standards for what we're doing here. Industry standards would be who are other projects that are really doing well at trying to clean plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should look at that. Uh, if someone wants to do research, R&D on that, what are the best efforts? There's one, there's some plastic project that's doing recycling and they're paying people, like I think it's in the third world a lot, where they're paying people for their trash. I'm not sure how much traction they have. I think they got some traction, but obviously not too much because there's a lot, a lot of plastic waste. Uh, so yeah, there's there is not a not a good project to that has, as far as I know, that has good traction on the on the problem. If there are, we sh we want to contact them and work with them, um, and they're going to be proprietary, so they're not going to work with you anyway. <laughs> I've looked at a couple <laughs> of them there. Well, it's it's uh, unfortunately it's true. Uh, the pro the the save the plastic, save the earth kind of project there. It's not open source. Like they don't, uh, they have a revenue model, but they, you know, they're just kind of hush hush, hush hush. It's not collaborative. They're they're not saying here's an open franchise of how you can do this. Um, there's a lot of limits to this, and we can do like a study of okay, here's how collaborative or open these projects are. Precious plastic is good because they are quite open. Uh, and that is open source equipment there, which we use their we use their shredder. We did a build of that before. We're going to do a bigger one now. They do have a, a shredder that they cost they cost like 5,000 bucks. We could do way better than that. Um, but we do want to study the industry standards. And so a lot of this process of how we develop this follows, if we're developing a product on the product side, if it's the machines themselves, then we want to follow the development template. So we want to seed that for the project. And as we do the development of the method for how you... Um, organize an incentive challenge so it's a replicable model that is like an enterprise development thing and we can actually document that we have a development template for enterprise too with some of the critical assets there so we can start seeding that so on our page for the incentive challenge we can put all those things in there use the existing remember the subst def plus there's also subst colon enterprise Enterprise is an enterprise template, and you see that under the CD Home. It's got the one development template, and the thing underneath it is is the. Um, if I share my screen. Uh, under Seed Home 2, you've got the top template is developing product, development template, and then below that is enterprise. Here's how you would develop an enterprise. So you have to start with a unique value proposition. You get into things like product strategy, cost structure, business plan, all of that. Uh, there's production, marketing, sales, and improvement. So there's, those are just general, generic things you want to develop if you're developing an enterprise around this. Uh, but I don't know. Any other feedback on why? What are the gaps in our? In other words, this is like the risk analysis. Like, what are the, um, what are the challenges? Your SWOT I'm analysis. Of, uh, fumes from the melting plastic. Mm -hmm. um, how are you going to control that? And yeah, to control that, you want to have an air purifying air filter system. Yeah. You do. Um, and some plastics are really bad, other plastics are not. 
and uh, there's some level, of, even like PLA, it's not, not the best, but you have to control your temperature. You can't fry it because then you decompose the plastic, so you got to just keep within te temperature range. I think the filter thing, like with charcoal and things, um, 3D printers use that currently. There's uh, various printers that have their built-in purifiers, so this is either, like if you're doing this indoors, you definitely want to do that in a purifier, with a, an air purifier. So, yeah, that that's a tech, technically that's uh, that's just basic filter technology though so that's not particularly onerous but I think probably probably that's the main one that's like the biggest one because plastics uh, given that they're uh, the way they're made but there are clean plastics like food grade plastics too which we would expect if you're working with those types then unless you you fry them to too high temperature you're not going to get pollution issues like I don't know, like for example, polyethylene, that's food grade, mm -hmm. or polypropylene, um, like the bottles we use. I mean, they can't, they can't have too much trash in them, too much, <laughs> it's going to have some, though we drink out of it already. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's an issue to consider, definitely the f air filtering system. That will be part of the technology to, to, to have on this, definitely. Now I'm also wondering... Uh, are you releasing a lot of carbon when you're melting plastic? Or uh, what do you mean by carbon? You're talking about electricity. That's no. I'm, well, I'm just thinking because uh, a lot of these plastics are um, made with petroleum. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, is it is it really that green? Um, no, it's not. It's it's can be green. There's bioplastics too. Right. So part of it. Uh, once this succeeds, then this could force more of a direction towards sustainable or green plastics. Okay. PLA is called green because it decomposes. Um, the idea is that any nasty chemistry or any bad way to do business can also be done in a good way, in a benign way. That's typically true. Yeah. So this would enforce the direction of, okay, let's now start producing in the world more sustainable plastics too. Mm -hmm. And then... At the end of the day, um, is that the long-term solution? Well, I mean, for now, we can think that there is a big plastic waste, so we, we can solve that. But in the long term, how do we really want housing to be done? Would it be more from more natural materials, like compressed earth blocks and cement, solar concrete, stuff like that, steel and, and concrete, natural <laughs> wood? Earth, earth is a great candidate for housing. That's absolutely good. And that's where we got the compressed earth block. Um, so, in the, and in the meantime, in this process, we can build a lot of houses. So, I guess a lot of the critique might be like, I think probably like social, like plastic, what plastic housing? Well, people already live in plastic housing, like it's, um, from trim to roofing or siding, like siding is plastic typically it depends what depends what you do but there's a lot of plastic in a house that you're plumbing um, other things yeah. so there's plenty of plastic already uh, it's not such a big switch from the way a house looks today like it would look like a normal house right. that's that's got vinyl siding and vinyl is one of the plastics uh, I think PVC and vinyl are some of the PVC is one of the most common plastics there's polyethylene I think is number one PVC is like up there top three I think um, but once again, and those are things people don't print with because you can't with a regular printer. You need the high temperature chamber. What is the number one? What is the number one plastic? The most common plastic? PVC or or PE? Most common plastic. Who's, what is it? polyethylene how would a house made out of this recycled plastic lumber react in say a fire like a home fire type oh, yeah. scenario that thing you that's that's a concern by all means uh, so because if the plastic hits its glass temp and starts to bend the whole house could collapse even mm -hmm. if it doesn't yeah. melt yeah. yeah 
yeah that that would be an issue there's plastic they make like for example computer cases and things they're made of fire retardant plastic and that's also uh, some nasty chemicals in there too but yeah yeah that's uh, how how different would it be than wood if I mean if you got a fire then I'd yeah. rather be in a plastic house than a wood house during a fire. I mean, really? Yeah. I mean, because I feel like <laughs> it melt and stick you inside of it. But really? at the same time, the flames would stop where they are. I feel like um, melting is your problem, but whereas wood, the problem is the fire coming to you. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <that's> right. Right. <laughs> you'll uh, you'll melt it. You'll collapse before the fire reaches you. I don't know. That's I haven't really thought about fire safety on that. Um, well, it depends on how hot the fire inside the house got, because yeah. even if it didn't yeah. actually reach the plastic walls, if it gets hot enough, the plastic can hit its glass point and start to deform under the weight of the upper floors. Yeah. And then the whole house basically just falls over without the flames even reaching the plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a similar experience to that. We were setting up a steam boiler and the temperature of the exhaust had been miscalculated and an entire PVC exhaust pipe just started bending down it made a U-shape basically yeah. mm -hmm. had to replace the entire thing with metal yeah. <clears throat> interesting point so I guess um, so cladding so part of, part of the solution would be okay you've got a house that's got some plastic in it that's all made from the recycled streams that would address that if you want to go all plastic I mean you're never gonna have all plastic like the foundation well I don't know maybe <laughs> you can do plastic foundations too it's like rot resistant lumber but better so there could be quite a bit so I don't know this is maybe something to think about in terms of marketing what are what are we maybe the message of plastic house is not the right thing maybe we say we're gonna solve the plastic issue and make plastic materials mm -hmm. um, maybe not go to the point of saying oh we're focusing on housing well we are doing housing because we're doing construction materials but we might not say oh, it's, like stay away from the message that oh it's a plastic house um, so yeah yeah there's, uh, but plastic is also for other things like there's transparent plastics like polycarbonate and you could be okay. talking about glazing or greenhouse structures. I mean, I can follow that. So that's yeah. another. Um, maybe we select a, a viewpoint that's more like, oh, we're going to do this particular thing: ponds and and greenhouses or aquaponics greenhouses where there's a lot of water. You're not mm -hmm. going to get into the risk of a house if people are concerned about that issue. House fire. And a lot of other uses, like what plastic lumber is currently used for, oh, yeah. uh, like oh, yeah. necking and that kind of stuff. If you necking. had a market that actually sell the lumber, mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, plastic lumber is quite expensive. It's more more expensive than yeah. regular lumber. So, I mean, there's a market right there. You can be talking. Okay, we're just going to produce materials. And it's uh, and from personal experience, it's a pain to work with usually because it's super dense and bends yeah. easily. So moving it around is like moving a big wobbly. Super heavy, uh, slinky. <laughs> uh, but that's probably was it hollow profile because I, I think the the way you print it could address that because you partial infill. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. The partial infill definitely could help. This is yeah. just like solid extruded boards. Right. Because uh, plastic lumber today is solid extruded pieces, and that means that mm -hmm. you have no control over what the interior structure. Whereas with three D printing, you have full control of the interior structure. Mm -hmm. which means you can do channels or partial infills and make it light and stiff as opposed to yep. heavy and and solid yeah mm -hmm. so yeah that would be a very uh, attractive quality for it to have uh, rigid mm -hmm. cheaper materials yeah mm -hmm. yeah um i think you know like i'm asking what what's wrong with this plan i don't know it's the thing is more I think the other question to ask is really can we do it because it's I mean it's definitely worth something worth worth doing the question more appropriate question maybe just like how do we get to do it and right. do we have the savvy like the once again the entrepreneurial savvy is what I always go back to um, 
which applies to <clears throat> getting anything out into the world. Yeah, so definitely. It's that part that I think is our, our challenge. Because there's plenty of good <laughs> ideas that can't get out into the to survive for various reasons. So it's are we good well, enough to make it happen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the open source nature of the project, I think, uh, increases its viability by a lot because instead, of, like, if you were doing it proprietarily, like starting a company doing this, mm -hmm. you'd have to hire on all the necessary talent, which is going to cost a fortune before you're even selling anything. Or, That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. With an open source project like this, you have access to a massive talent pool, theoretically. Right, right. And that's, that's the selling point of open source, is that you're reducing your development cost. That's a known mm -hmm. feature of open development and why all software companies now do it. Whereas a decade or two ago, none of them did it. Yeah. Now it's common that all the software companies do do it and contribute to open projects. Um, for the common core, but not necessarily the, the the open source product at the end, but common core, open core, meaning mm -hmm. the the underlying code. That then, like Amazon and Facebook gets built on. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um. Yeah, like Facebook Messenger, which is built off of the open source project Signal. Basically, all of its back-end code is mm. directly taken from Signal. Mm. <laughs> I see. I didn't know that. Yep. That's yeah, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> open source is a very effective way to develop. That's a known fact. And it's not a known fact for hardware. People somehow think no. that hardware is different. But once you digitize yeah. hardware, which means create a full digital model, it be behaves a lot like software. And it can mm -hmm. be non-scarce. There especially seems to be a lack of open source development in hardware when it comes to large scale and industrial equipment. I mean, there's right. like, like with 3D printers, there's the RepRep project and all kinds of open source hobbyist printers. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, there aren't any large industrial size printers that are open source and that are a viable project. That's exactly right. And that's our opportunity space. You said it. Yeah. Um, it's a people, completely empty market, basically. Yeah. Complete opportunity. So. That's how it works, and I think it's largely because may maybe the hobbyists, they, they don't think at that scale, maybe. It's, mm -hmm. it's largely like the hobbyist versus, okay, now you're going industrial. Different story. It's more than something you can do in a spare time that you have. Like a 3D printer yeah. was a great one because it's such a tiny thing. Very manageable for a lot of a lot of hobby people. But once you start... Well, something, larger, yeah. something you said the other day um, caught my attention. You were talking about how this project basically could give anybody the ability to make their own living, right? Yeah. Which yeah. really helps with that kind of thing because, like you said, a bunch most of the hobbyists are just doing it in their spare time and they typically have a full-time job and that's their main focus. Whereas if this allows people to basically make this their main focus, <laughs> you can get a lot more um, advancement yeah, exactly. in a much shorter yeah. time. And that's a cultural shift. That's what we're working on. And then the product of that is called the open source economy, where everyone's collaborating on product development and eliminating all that in, insane waste that happens right now. So in my view, that's mm -hmm. just inevitable that, that will happen. I mean, we can't continue to be as wasteful as we are today for much longer if problems that we face are getting more complex and it's getting easier to yeah. solve them because we've got more technology, more know-how. So, so we need to upgrade our mental operating systems towards open to make that happen and yeah. I think a lot of like the success of this this incentive challenge would be to to raise a lot of awareness on that one by the rules that we set we're saying we're rewarding you for collaboration and that's a that's a game changer right there you know so and then on top of that you've got the technical uh, background behind it that says, oh, it's actually going to lead somewhere to real economic significance. Whereas a lot of the socially oriented projects, they're forgetting. Like I say, I always say that open source forgets one big thing, product, <laughs> like an open hardware. You got to have a product. And a lot of the social movements, they're kind of forgetting. Um, I think they, they kind of forget the same thing, but they're, you know, you have to, it's about the livelihood at the end. Goodwill can only go so far when you got to pay for your rent and 
and uh, have some food in your tummy. So yeah, um, you got to get to the level of the livelihoods. Without that, we're we're not we're not delivering the promise of open hardware, which is to make access just unprecedented access happen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those like you know social programs and nonprofit programs rely on funding from big companies usually, which ironically makes it makes them sort of like controlled in a way. Yeah. Like if the big companies don't like what they're doing or it's hitting their bottom line, they can just pull funding and the project dies. Yeah. That's def that's a subtle thing and it definitely does happen. The the very basic thing is how can you expect the system that generated this wealth to also transform it? That would be basically to cannibalize itself. Yeah. That's not a good incentive structure for them. They're not going to do that. Yeah. So it does require innovation from the outside to make that happen. Yeah. It's a big issue with venture capital, that whole world. Just the. Yeah. And yeah. What you're saying. And that's why it's like I'm not, I never bothered like with foundations and funding and all that. The other part being yeah. it's like we got to replicate this in scale. And um, you can't get enough funding to do that. Nobody's got that kind of money to yeah. to start all the all the good work, basically a, a thorough economic transformation. There's not enough money in the mm -hmm. world for that to happen, or there's not the incentive structure for that to happen. So uh, it has to happen from boundary crossing outsiders. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, Now just thinking about the oh, no, I was on like the challenges. This, but, um, yeah, um, the challenges. The I'm thinking. I mean, how many people? Again. What is the market for it? Like, um, would would you guys want? Uh, would, would you guys want plastic lumber? Well, then, yes. For your house. And I want. I want to ask, um, to be able to create an open source project entirely. From 3D printed parts and not have to source yeah. other parts. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm interested in like using the the plastic for other things, um, but I mean, I don't know if what I'm just thinking about the house in particular with plastic lumber, because now that uh, he raised the point about fire, it's got me thinking about okay, collapsing uh, fumes. And mm -hmm. <laughs> now, yeah. I'm, now I'm all of a sudden paranoid about that. Okay, so the thing that's partial answer to you is the concept of rot. I mean, wood. The way a house falls down is things rot, and right. this is rot resistant. So maybe, what if you're doing the foundation from lumber? They do have foundations that are made of heavy lumber's. It's uh, rot resistant. Uh, so that could be one one aspect. So there's definitely areas like uh, in parts of the house, like, like for example, siding that already is plastic. It's vinyl, vinyl siding, which is most houses are built like that right now right. in the U.S. Um, but definitely the rot resistance. Like you know, we built the pond, mm -hmm. like an aquaponic greenhouse. It's crumbled. The the, the, the pond has kind of crumbled because rot gets it. Some oyster mushrooms started growing out of it. Right, uh, so that's a real issue anywhere you have contact with the ground. Like if you have a post yeah. for a patio outside or something, so that that part is in a, a total advantage. Plaster, plastic lumber, like say you want to make a pond with liner, easy, low cost. Yeah. You know, um, that part is good, and maybe not not others where you're thinking about like the whole dry parts or framing, whatever, that's like the essence of the house, yeah. and we do other parts. But a foundation already is 20% of the cost. Yeah. So at the very least, you've got significant cost reduction on the house itself right. as the, the outcome. Yeah. I mean, I've been thinking about it, uh, with this idea that I was telling some of these guys about uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. um, using the plastic um, in the same way that they use, I believe, I believe it was aircrete. Mm. Um, they they'll put up a kind of a mold, a temporary structure with blocks, mm -hmm. and then they'll pour in uh, uh, the concrete. Ah. I wanted to 
there you go to do that with the plastic yes with rammed earth instead there you go yeah how about that's a that's a fireproof yeah high performance house you got huge like thermal cool. mass yeah, right yeah yep yeah. exactly so maybe maybe that's that's the product value proposition that we might go forward like it's or foundation forms like when you pour, even pour a foundation yeah. you can use this like if you've got printed <coughs> shapes that saves yeah. you a lot of work there and you can just leave it there yeah. um, or maybe even reuse it if you want to um, yeah, yeah yeah I do like that I thought about that too and it's a great use yeah because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we're not forms we're not uh, mechanizing uh, rammed earth construction nearly enough it just seems like it shouldn't be that hard uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you look at this. Yeah, just tool. think of a lightweight shell and yeah. you just fill it with dirt and you're done. You pour some water down to compact it and it packs right. down, dries out. You don't have to worry about rot like yeah. with right. normal wood. There you go. Maybe maybe we pitch that. Uh, so maybe we're developing this new construction method. Uh, it's kind of like rammed earth with a shell. It's, yeah. it's a different thing. Uh, it's That's like insulated concrete forms. ICFs, which is foam, and then you pour concrete into it. They have that already. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's forms for the kind of stuff. What they do with rammed earth is they have these huge forms and then they take them off. Yeah. Uh, that's what happens yeah. right now. After they're done. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, but the form idea is very good because you can make structures like so it doesn't bust out. You can make little connectors inside. It's a low cost way to do large scale forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just that with fill it with dirt, yeah, that would be it. Um, so maybe, yeah. So whoever's listening to this, maybe they'll take on the branch with the the insulating plastic forms. Now the insulating part is if you print multiple layers of that. So maybe you have this form multiple layers. So uh, multiple multiple layers like multiple pane windows. And because you can control the 3D printed structure, there's only very little connection between the layers, so it's highly insulating. Yes, how about actually printing the insulating structure, fill it with dirt, so you got insulation, you got thermal mass. Yeah. Something to look at. Could you, in theory, like fill different she sheets of plastic lumber that have internal um, hollow yes. spaces sure. with, like, you know, they have that fiberglass insulation that you like spray into in between mm -hmm. like joists. Yeah. You do a similar thing like that. Fill up the panels. You can do that. Fiberglass that stuff ain't cheap though. You get into yeah. like the cost of uh, like extend polystyrene uh, insulation. Those kinds of foams are not, they, they're actually not too cheap. They're, that's advanced chemistry there. Um, or something similar, I don't know. Yeah. Not necessarily those foams, but yeah. Yeah. Some kind of um, insulating material that's light. Yeah, I mean, uh, like the equivalent of plastic peanuts. Plastic peanuts are insulating. What if we could 3D print plastic peanuts? Peanut-like structures. What I described about the multiple layers, that's kind of like the effectively the, the peanut. The peanut have peanuts have just tiny air pockets that's why they're they're so insulating that's that's all about how this works there's a lot large percentage of airspace I don't know exactly what it is but it's a large percentage of airspace and therefore you don't conduct the heat and we can print that at you know like a millimeter resolution so um, doing what if you getting into the insulating kinds of uh, prints that would be that's something I haven't really heard about that yeah. Uh, but it's definitely a, something to look at. They already have poly, okay, so polycarbonate multi-wall glazing. Um, let me show you this um, on the wiki. 3D printing in construction. Uh, there's an Open Building Institute presentation on that. I want to show, let's see, am I sharing my screen? Let me. Things that you can do right now. So let's see, edit this thing. We've got, yeah, we've got this document. Check, check this. I printed that. 
twin wall mm. glazing. Yeah. You can talk about multi 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 multiple wall mm. glazing, and that's going to get you a lot of insulation. Like already the polycarbonate. This is just PLA. Uh, can't can't with a simple printers do polycarbonate like this. But with a high temperature, this is complete game. This is cool because that kind of stuff is quite expensive. The, the multi wall glazing, and that's um. So that's an insulating plastic, but just make the cavities really small and make make like 10, 20, 30 of them over, you know, millimeter wide cavities over like 30 of them only take like three centimeters or so. Um, Recording is on. So there, that's a valuable product right there. And um, yeah. four by eight sheet is four by 45 bucks at Menards. Hmm. If you print it, I can do it much less. Regrind you could get for a uh, dollar a pound. If you're recycling CDs, if you have a bunch of free CDs, then you can get it for free. Print your 3D printing, 3D printed uh, aquaponics towers. Yeah, um, that's a simple filament maker. That's precious plastic shredder and extruder. That's existent technology. This is the one we built and we pressed out some rolls of ABS filament with that and that already gets you pretty pretty good accuracy. Did you use did you use like new new resin or yeah. recycled? No, that was just new pellets. So that's cheating. You don't want to do that. You want to get into the, <laughs> the waste. And so the this is the Lyman filament maker. And with that, that only has a half inch barrel, so you want to size up the barrel a little bit to one inch, and you can have larger flakes of regrind, and that's what we're going to build. We're going to build something that looks like this, uh, basically an extruder motor driving a screw down a heated barrel, and you're spitting out molten plastic. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty scalable. I mean, yeah. you just have a giant industrial shredder feeding into a bunch of those assemblies, yes. producing filament. Because one of these is not, not too expensive. It requires a motor, an auger bit, and a heater element. That doesn't cost a lot. There's a temperature controller in there that's like 10 bucks or 20 bucks, um, but not expensive. So you can have a bank of these spitting out filament. And these make like, I think we did, was it like two hours for a spool? So you could get 12 mm -hmm. spools of filament from one of these filament makers already. I mean, get a bank of them. <laughs> few of them next to each other and you got a lot of productivity so for 12, yeah. 12 kilos let's say 12 kilos per day and that's just for a small one like with a half inch barrel uh, I think we can do probably a little better than that yeah, if you size it up to like you were talking about the five millimeter filament if you produce yeah, if it you, faster most of the time. yeah if you did five millimeter filament yeah and this is like the it's gonna increase here. the energy cost but that's handleable. Yeah, the cost is actually quite negligible when you look at the numbers. So that's good. Um, I think I'm getting like two cents per pound or so here. How feasible is this? Oh, Lyman does. Oh yeah, like twelve pounds per twenty-four hours. Um, yeah, the scalability part of getting multiple heads. Is the good part. Let's see. Do I have any numbers on a on the electricity cost? Yeah, fifty cents per pound, um, but down to about three cents per pound if you're running on a solar solar PV panel system. Because solar PV is actually cheaper these days than than grid electricity, so you can get the cost down to uh, a few cents per per pound. And compared to the cost of the final product, that's that's small. Um, a roll of filament is two pounds, and that costs you twenty dollars. Here, you're talking about using these numbers here, like six cents in terms of electricity cost for that. So that is a small part. And this one actually needs to be updated uh, for. It's pretty accurate. It's. I think we we can realistically, if we're doing. Uh, we have a system on our house uh, on the CD home that it costs us two cents per kilowatt hour. That's how much we pay for electricity. That's one fifth the, the grid cost. 
So if grid cost is 10 cents, um, we're paying two. But the numbers are actually adding up. They do add up quite well because the filament maker only requires that the filament maker I showed there. It's only, um, I think, 100 or 200 watts. So in other words, you can um, Uh, where was that? Well, that's what I'm getting there, one cent per kilogram. So the OSE results, this is what we did a couple of years ago. One kilogram spool of filament produced in two hours. 200 watts using the Lyman filament maker below. 50 watt motor, 150 watt heater, so that's 200 watts of usage. So about 5 cents cost per kilogram at grid cost of 12 cents. So that's nothing, pretty nothing. much. So I wonder what the material know. cost would be in, if you were using recycled plastic. 10 cents a, a pound here, so I, I talk about this here. Uh, par purchase garbage bales are about 10 cents per pound, so you get one of those, those ton bales for like 100 or 2. 200 bucks or so for a ton bale so that's that's what we're at and if you're collecting that yourself it can be as cheap as you find it even if you undercut like basically every other filament on the market in terms of price that's still an incredible markup it's still an incredible markup and that's because one they they're 10x higher on the resin cost, because virgin resin costs 10 times as much, it's about a dollar a pound. And then they've mm -hmm. got their operations, and then marketing and sales and all that, using all proprietary expensive equipment, and it ends up being 20 bucks a, a roll. Yeah, with that kind of markup, the scalability <laughs> is insane. <laughs> and that points to one, one amazing product could be filament. Now, we call it yeah. filament, it's shit filament, because it's, it's, it's pretty crappy. But it's great for what we want to do. Uh, maybe don't sell for 20 bucks, sell for like 5 bucks a pound. That's, uh, that's what I meant, even yeah. like yeah. that. And you've got a huge <laughs> business right there. Now people would have to have Shillman capable printers, which, are, which we are producing. So uh, even with the 1.2 nozzles, that the nozzle size is big enough that you can, we don't get clogs, clog issues. We gave up on the other ones, like we used the Prusa extruder, then the Titan Arrow, and then we said, nah, this is, the Titan Arrow was, it's called a state of art of what's out there, but man, if you clog it, you have to take apart the whole thing. It's designed in such a way. So yep. we said, uh-uh, we can't do that. We can't have a print farm and spend like, it's only like 15 minutes to open it up and put it back together, but you can't be doing that if you've got 100 printers or no. whatever, or a print farm. That's just, you need a full-time job to manage just, just the print heads. So uh, you want to design things very simply. And we are doing that with a very simple design that we have. Nice. It'd be nice to go over 3D printers soon. Yeah. Yeah, we should probably crank them out. Uh, I'm printing parts right now at my house for them. We can uh, look into that. We've got a couple here that are... Uh, that one, that extruder is clogged on ours. So I, we got to look into what's happening there, but I was getting a clog on our printers that we have here. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being able to take apart the entire printhead assembly to fix clogs is nice. Or, yeah. sorry, not having to take the whole thing apart to fix clogs. Yeah, yeah, we don't have to do that. Um, Mm-hmm. So yeah, we've gone through a bunch of um, like the value proposition points. Um, let's see where we are at right now in terms of. So let's break off for lunch pretty soon, and then come back and actually um, maybe delve into the work. We're kind of like getting introduced to the whole situation here. Maybe dive, dig down into some of the work. Um, but what do we have so far 
on or dock. Yeah. So for prior work, like for the reward structure, we reframe that to allocating resources to, to problems that we identify milestones defined. Is there a link to a script there already? Yeah, we've got a draft of a script. We can start, we can rework it, uh, make that doc live editable. Anyone on the internet can comment, hey, make it, make it writable. <laughs> Because we do have reversion version history where you can restore if you don't like it. That's good. Excellent. Can prior work. Yeah, industry standards. There's. Uh, I actually say just just for your reference, I've looked at a bunch of this stuff. I would, do, would encourage you, like for example, if you go to MJ Log, I'll probably find 3D printer. In, like if I control F industry standards, I probably have that. Um, you know, I, I live this, so I probably have a lot of this stuff. So, uh, skid steer, bulldozer, bulldozer, open system, air purifier. So, extruder analysis of industry standards. Extruder, extruder is relevant. Extruder for 3D printer. So that's that's. Like the wiki does have a lot of stuff in there, <coughs> so search in there. And it's actually a bad thing whenever I look up open source this or that, it's a bad sign when it goes back to our wiki. Because <laughs> that means we don't know anything about it. <laughs> no, there's some development, but I was hoping that someone would have something better. <laughs> some some experts in the fields would, would show up. Um, you're the guy. It's the column being on the forefront. So I'm going to put, like for example, when we're doing the industry standards, I'm going to paste that in there. Uh, Ken, why don't you do that? Why don't you scour the wiki, make a link. We have to have a page called 3D printer, high temperature 3D printer industry standards. Let's see, control F. Because that's, I mean, that's our starting point. It's like if we're not looking at that, we're just reinventing the wheel. So we always go industry standards. That means patents. That means other companies. Whatever exists on it. Open source projects. So let's see. Um, high temperature. There's 13 that says high temperature. There's a high temperature heated enclosure, which I showed. High temperature 3D printing article. That's just. How hot yes. again did you want to get the internal build chamber? 167 to 200. 167 is the glass transition temperature, the working, t the max working temperature of PEI plastic, which is mm -hmm. the shield that we're saying that's on top that's clear. Or if we want to go higher, we would have to have a, a different sh uh, material shield. Or perhaps. What type of. Hmm? Sorry, uh, what type of materials would we be targeting at a higher temperature than that? Name it. Uh, you name it. Types? Every single plastic. So you come up really? with PEI, peak, um, acetal, like all this stuff. Would there be any... Anything that's that's thermal, thermoplastic, any temperature. <coughs> so the ones that are like 450C melt temperatures, like there's some really high ones, but... The chamber on that is going to have to be like, yeah, like around 200. But that we can do with the existing, like with the current concept of, of PI as that shield, you can do that right there. Uh, so, Ken, uh, back to the industry science. Look, scour the wiki and see what you can find. And of course, scour the internet, wherever. The wiki is part of the, the web. So, um, maybe start a page on the industry standards for high temperature printers. I know I put a page up there about cost analysis of high temperature printers. And when we say cost, cost analysis of high temperature printers, 
uh, temperature is like above 150 and then you're going to talk about size like I don't think the companies that make the large insulated printers even put their costs online because they're so high that you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars so we're talking about competing right now with printers that are in the hundred thousand dollar scale and up uh, if we do the 4x4x8 four by four by so um, it's a good reference point to say oh in our video and by the way we're gonna be be 35 times less expensive than these next guys <laughs> they'll be great but we have to have that concrete data to say okay we studied our, our system and here's the best we found okay um, so Ken that's Ken's just to review Wesley talking about effective for the contest mm -hmm. it would probably be good to have some kind of like um, target level of um, like material compatibility for the printer right mm -hmm. like a temperature range basically yeah. that has materials that we really want to be printing with in it yeah, instead of can... just trying to hit a sky high goal well but but uh, the sky high goal it's not really sky high because this is as good as it gets we're getting to the top of what there is because we can and it's not it doesn't cost us any more the, the system that we're talking about I think the highest you ever have to get in systems like this is around that 200 I don't think any of the I haven't studied deep enough but the the high performance printers that people sell they they go up to those kinds of numbers like maybe 150 or so so we actually can say we might even be better like highest temperature in the world just because it's doable easily this way I mean we're simplifying the system that we're getting rid of that bellows and stuff we're keeping everything outside the good printers keep everything outside uh, keep an insulated chamber and um, yeah I mean this is a state of art as it gets so we don't have to be shy about that one I don't think that's an issue but we yeah. can do like for infographics we can say oh and at these temperature ranges we can print these materials and you go down into the highest performance ones which we say oh by the way yeah we can print those too so a nice informative list an infographic on that part I think would be very useful uh, yeah way. I just mean like in the goal or the goals of the contest have like the list of materials that we want the system to be able to um, reliably handle mm -hmm. yeah I think we probably because you can get there's a lot of plastics out there so it's like the simple way to, to frame that is we want a printer that a achieves this temperature and this temperature gradient throughout the chamber so that way you say oh okay if it can reach that temperature it can do this so you can derive that and we can show some examples there's too many plastics out there I, th I think the simple thing to say there is, is just the, the temperature range anyone in the know like who cares about this and knows this they'll be like huh? holy cow that's good so yeah well <laughs> uh, and the people that don't know about it they'll uh, so if somebody doesn't know about it we, we, we can say oh yeah well, this can print with with anything pretty much anything I don't know if there's anything that we can't from the thermoplastics outside of things that are just not printable period but I don't know I, I don't think that exists I mean that then you call it a thermal set it doesn't print right? it, it just does that once you can't melt it um, if you try to melt it it decomposes before it melts uh, maybe there's some plastics that have like a very narrow like they have this tiny window of melt and after that they uh, just blow up <laughs> just decompose um, yeah I haven't looked into too many details of that outside of knowing that some really valuable plastics like things that you can make bearings out of bushings uh, for, for glide gliding like when the big big universal axes um, those all those kinds of things and PEI which is our print print surface yeah you can do would be able to print with all of those by all means if the entire body of the printed object is kept at glass point temperature inside the chamber um, how does thermal contraction affect it then when the printer is cooled down um, I don't know I, I mean typically the idea is if you 
uh, as long as it's held at the same temperature, you don't have the differential. The differential is what mm-hmm. makes the layers separate. If you keep right. it at the same temperature, it might shrink or whatever whatever its thermal expansion or contraction coefficient is. Uh, but that's just like for anything. It's I don't think that's I don't know what those numbers are, but it's apparently not Managed large because people roughly. print with um, plastics on a regular basis. So. Um, yeah. It's like the, I've never seen a, my PLA shrink after it cooled, for example. Uh, so it may may be like tiny, but it may hardly be noticeable. Uh, for for, for, for um, say we print like our pl- plastic lumber, we know the thermal coefficient of expansion. Then we say, okay, we print it like one percent bigger, so it ends up at the right size or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we need those, I've kinds printed of- with ABS on a, a Delta printer without a heated enclosure and it gets to be real troublesome when the with the thermal contraction when the print gets too high um, and because of the ABS's high thermal thermal contraction rate mm-hmm, it like mm-hmm. your print will shrink by like 5% pull itself entirely okay. off the bed in the corner yeah yeah and that we're addressing by the by the high temperature chamber that's that's right, exactly right. the thing so when you cool it, it, it doesn't doesn't um, delaminate. Yep. Yeah. So I'm seeing Wes has got some notes on effective collaboration, state yeah, of art in the there. So we can do uh, blend of the multiplayer. Um, and that would be useful for either like editing the CD, like pretty much editing, I don't know, like editing what, editing files? or anime, like so one thing is like, okay, we could take like a CD Ecohome module mm-hmm. and do like animation on it, or, or rendering, and I, I'm wondering like if maybe we should, like if Blender is a better solution than FreeCAD, what do you think about that? It's both, I mean Blender's not designed for any of the analysis stuff that we have in it, I mean it's both tools, Blender's really good at rendering and animation, let's use it for it. The big thing FreeCAD is, is really good at some other things. Is FreeCAD is, is very slow at iterating on uh, on actually just modeling parts. Um, like the functionality in Blender is like, in, in my opinion, is like five or ten times better. Um, it doesn't have the CAD aspects, but like you said, your constraint based <coughs> modeling is not like, good. Like, Say what? You said like constraint-based modeling is not ideal and the best no, that's moving and rotating three parts. No, I mean I think both both tools have their uses and the disadvantage of Blender at this point is the heavy learning curve. So we can't just get somebody in an hour designing anything, pretty much. I think that could be simplified, I think. Um, that's the first time I hear that. I find them both kind of challenging. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't really know. I know FreeCAD just because I've yeah. seen FreeCAD before now, and now I've worked with it with Blender. We have uh, we have a few data points of people learning FreeCAD within an hour. I, you're the first person who says that you can do that level in an hour. But. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe you gotta write our, us the instructional for it. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, like, you can you can model like a humanoid in Blender, but to do that, and you can model a humanoid in Blender, and in, in uh, you could learn how to do it, go through the whole process in like five hours. In FreeCAD, it would take you months. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. You do the things that FreeCAD is good in the square geometries. Yeah, of course you you'll never do that in FreeCAD. You can't do it because it doesn't have those functions. So I think the simple answer is both, and that's the we like the answer of both. A lot of times in this project, because it's we want to use all the tools. It's inclusive, right? So that's that drives with inclusive. Um, so I don't think there's any contradiction. But to say we all migrate to it, that would be uh, definitely prohibitive in terms of anyone being able to to do it, unless you've got you're working with all the people, the Blender people, that are doing that. So, but at that point, we'd miss out on all the CAD people that actually know how to design the. 3D printers and things. So there's only, trade-offs for each. It's only a matter of time before Blender gets a CAD plugin and like widespread yeah. CAD adoption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that would be awesome. That would be that would be a greatest thing. Then you can do Maybe it'll both of those things. That would be great. 
we can we always learn and use new tools yeah so that'd be good um, let's see what else what else we got here Sam um, Christian Paul. so what, what I'm looking for is like links like say Paul's got his link and that means we're <coughs> Yeah, we should always do like links to both the log, the wiki. The advantage of wiki links is that any page you can put in a double bracket and that becomes a link, so it's a hypertext environment. You can learn a lot by saying, okay, so the universal axis can do, and then universal axis is a link and so forth. You can you can transfer a lot of knowledge because you're linking to uh, readily to, to other pages. Um, yeah, for instance. Design toolkit. Mm -hmm. How come I can't click on Paul Fam work log there? Um, did I make the link incorrect? Is that just me or is it? I'm not. Are people able to access that link? I can't click on it. <laughs> Paul Fam, Paul Fam work log. Yeah, it's not a link. What happened there? If you click on it, doesn't a link appear beneath it, like wiki.open source? Oh, now it does. Yeah, oh, I had to click on. Okay, it's it's like it is but uh, it's, uh, it's linked oh, to the it, word word maybe. Like no, it's you have to click on the text above before you click on the link itself, which is kind of weird. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh yeah. So other thing about the work log, since you're gonna have to scroll down after the six months quite a bit, newest on top, so that you access access the first, latest thing, yeah. first. Yeah. Um, cool stuff. Uh, toolkit. We're studying how to how to define this. Hero X notes by Joshua. Yeah, and because there's this prior work on a, instead of challenge on the wiki, try to link, you know, integrate, clean up pages, combine pages as well. It's all collaborative development stuff. Um, Yep. Cool. Yeah, so we've got a little bit here. We talked a lot about kind of the ideas. We got I think we got some forward motion on conceptualization. So let's let's break for lunch and what we'll do after lunch, let's just hit it and try to solve the things we kinda of signed up for and try to put in a little bit of dedicated development time to it. So we'll be back here in, at one eleven or uh, after one hour from now. Okay, thanks a lot. Great stuff.